Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. M. N. Gupta, Emeritus Professor from Department of Biochemical Engineering and Biotechnology at Indian Institute of Technology. So today we are going to talk on module clonal selection theory from the paper on immunology. We have mentioned that clonal selection theory argues that immune responses are based upon ready-made rather than made to measure or custom-made operating systems. The success of the clonal selection theory was based upon its ability to explain all the hallmarks of the immunity, specificity, memory and tolerance. And the clonal selection theory was able to explain all these with the help of some simple postulates. So the objective of this module are to learn about how clonal selection theory explains the features of the immune system, to learn about two different types of B cells which are able to take care of different types of antigens also to understand how antibodies have some similarities with the enzymes. In fact, catalytic antibodies can be produced using transition state analogs as epitopes. We will also learn about hybridoma technology and understand how we can produce monoclonal antibodies, humanized monoclonal antibodies and FV molecules. So the concept map is all about clonal selection theory, the types of B cells and antigens, specificity, memory and tolerance such as the hallmarks of the immune system and also to learn about monoclonal antibodies, what they are, how are they produced, how are they purified and what are their you know, very important applications. So, Niles Journey is credited with bringing in the idea of selectivity to explain immune system functions. Sir McFarlane Burnett gave the final shape to clonal selection theory. Actually, Journey resurrected the notion of selection. His ideas were sort of right trigger at the right time. For Burnett, suddenly everything fell into the right place. The jigsaw was complete. It's not correct to pit Journey's network theory against clonal selection theory. Doing that is simplistic but creates confusion. The existence of Journey's network continues to find evidence. The network idea is not necessarily incompatible with clonal selection theory. Continuously made by the body, these lymphocytes then have IgM as receptors which has a different specificities and are present on B cells surface. So this event, their production takes place in the bone marrow. So, any single cell has IgM which has only one binding specificity. In fact, as we will see, many other surface molecules on the B lymphocytes also take part in the overall involvement of the B lymphocyte later on. Thus, the role of B lymphocyte in secreting antibody should not be viewed as the only isolated Role. For example, Th cells help in B cell response. This Th cell cooperation is specific in nature. This cooperation with the T cell is mediated by B cell surface molecules. None of these B cell surface molecules diminish the specificity of the B cell towards a particular antigenic determinant or epitope. 
an invading pathogen will have several antigenic determinants and several antigens actually to start with. Some may be surface antigens, others may become accessible upon its phagocytosis. And of course, each antigens will have several antigenic determinants. For any antigenic determinant, a subset of B lymphocyte populations will have IgM receptors which will bind to the antigenic determinant. This is the deselection step. So, some clones of B lymphocytes are selected. So, that is why this theory is called clonal selection theory. The members of the selected subset of B lymphocytes do not bind to the same antigenic determinant with the same binding constant. The fine tuning to select lymphocytes out of the subset which have binding constants in the optimum range of values takes place much later and that process is called affinity maturation. A population of cells with a common immediate progenitor cell is called a clone. The set of diverse B cells pre-exist before the selection is made and the existence of these B cell variants is independent of the subsequent selection event. Hence, clonal selection theory is analogous to Darwinian concept of natural selection. B cells produced by bone marrow are circulating cells of the blood and the lymph. Lymph is the fluid in the tissues. They have a lifetime, they are released and circulate in the blood or lymph and they die after a while. New cells are in the meanwhile being released by the bone marrow all the time. During their circulation, if a B cell recognizes an antigen or epitope, the cell begins its different phases of maturation and these phases consist of growth, proliferation to produce its clones and then producing a long lived progeny called memory cells. This pre-existing population is one mechanism which is responsible for generation of antibody diversity. This component of diversity is genetic in nature as it is defined by existing genes which are naturally present in the organism. There is another component which is actually somatic in nature and we will look at this somatic and genetic components in slightly more detail elsewhere. Most of the discussion on clonal selection theory takes place around B cells and humoral response. The reasons are purely historical. Our knowing about nature of B cell receptors preceded the identification of T cell receptor by several years. There was a period when scientists thought that there is only one kind of a lymphocyte that is B lymphocytes. Identification of T cells, learning about types of T cells and their roles etc. came up much later. Acceptance of clonal selection theory facilitated our placing the new information along with the known bits of information neatly. In fact, participation of T cells in the case of a specific antigen is according to clonal selection theory. They also proliferate and also create memory cells. In the maturation phase, proliferation is accompanied by distinct changes in the B cell population. The cells become bigger in size, protein synthesizing and secretory mechanisms appear in abundance. In about 5 days after the encounter, the selected clone of cells are found to be secreting antibodies. Some of these become memory B cells. These are also specific to the antigenic determinant and persist for some time 
for the entire lifetime if they do not encounter the antigen the memory b cells can make igg or iga and respond if second encounter takes place the memory cells in experimental systems are responsible for the secondary response they are also the basis for immunization or vaccination the b cells which are specific to self antigens are eliminated early in their life cycles this is responsible for immune system distinguishing between self and non self antibodies the immunoglobulins share many similarities with another class of proteins called enzymes the delta g of binding of many heptanes is in the range of minus 6 to minus 15 kilocalories per mole which overlaps with the corresponding values for many enzyme substrate and enzyme coenzyme systems antibody against dextrans reach its maximum of binding constant with a hexamer of glucose in lysozyme hexamer of nag binding provides the similar picture the binding length for both antibodies and enzymes like lysozyme thus can be estimated to be about 25 angstrom the fluorescent emission spectra of the bound fluorescent heptane compared with the corresponding free form of the heptane indicate that binding site has non polar environment the difference is that enzymes are catalysts however during their role as receptor antibody upon antigen binding does not form just a complex it sends signals down the line even in free state immune complexes have tremendous physiological importance also linus pauling predicted in 1948 that an antibody raised against a transition state intermediate of a reaction will catalyze that reaction many decades later catalytic antibodies were discovered a catalytic antibody called 38c2 was the first commercially available catalytic antibody and that catalyzes aldolase type reactions two different types of b cells exist b cells arise very early during ontological development these b1 cells are distinguished by the fact that they mostly produce igm antibodies encoded by germline they mature independent of bone marrow the antigens which b1 cells recognize are polysaccharides and lipids from microbes these b cells do not require th cells for proliferation and differentiation after recognizing antigen whenever one talks of b cells unless otherwise mentioned generally the reference is to b2 type cells whatever we have discussed so far in even in earlier modules generally has been with the reference to the b2 type cells so b2 types are the main stream lymphocytes which primarily mediate humoral response the characteristics of the b2 type cells are that they are produced in bone marrow require th cells for proliferation and differentiation and they also differentiate into plasma cells which are capable of class switching and can produce igg iga and ige antibodies the need for two types of b cells has its origin in the two types of antigens firstly thymus independent antigens which are called ti antigens thymus dependent antigens which are called td antigens activation of b1 cells to some antigens does not require t cell involvement in such cases b1 cells respond to t1 antigens by producing igm these igms are relatively low affinity antibodies to the antigen humans and mice who have t cell deficiency 
still are able to make antibodies towards many bacterial antigens. These TI antigens stimulate live B cells without any specific T cell. However, T cells do influence B cell response to TI antigens through cytokines such as IL-5. This has been verified by the fact that animals without T cells have fewer of B1 cells. In fact, TI antigens in turn can be divided further into two classes as these stimulate B cells in different ways. These antigens do not select any clones of B cells. So their effect of B cells is rather non-specific in nature. This is called polyclonal activation. These antigens are sometimes called B cell mitogens. Lectins are important mitogens for lymphocytes. Some also act on B lymphocytes. An important mitogen for B1 cells are lipopolysaccharides, often simply called LPS. LPS can activate both B cells and dendritic cells. For B cell activation, 100 times greater concentration of LPS is required. At these high concentrations, it doesn't require any specific antigen receptor binding for proliferation of B cells and secretion of antibodies. At low concentrations, 10 raised to the power 3 to the 10 raised to the power 5 in that range, those times less than for polyclonal activation, at those in the range of the low concentration, only those B cells get activated which have specific receptors for the TLI antigens. This is antibody response to specific epitopes of TL1 antigen. This response is physiologically relevant during early stages of infection when only low concentration of TL1 antigen is present and T cells response is not available. Their priming and proliferation is yet to take place. TL1 antigens do not require isotype switching, do not induce isotype switching, do not induce affinity maturation or results in memory cells as all these require T cell help. These which have repetitive structural units and are part of the bacterial capsules Immature B cells are inactivated by such antigens, hence TI2 antigens only induce response by mature B cells. In fact, infants are more prone to some infections as they only have immature B cells. B1 cells respond to TI2 antigens. These CD5 B cells are autonomously replicating B cells. Marginal zone B cells are non-circulating B cells which line the border of white pulp of spleen. These increase with age and are responsible for increasing physiological response to TI2 antigens with age. The epitope density in TI2 antigens is critical for their stimulation of B cells. These antigens act by cross-linking of receptors of mature B cells. Too extensive cross-linking results in unresponsive or energic B cells. Insufficient cross-linking, on the other hand, does not activate B cells. White nude mice, which has no thymus, show response to TI2 antigens. Total depletion of T cells abolishes the response. Adding T cells in vivo, however, does augment the response. The role of T cell involvement is not clear but is believed to be of non-specific kind. These responses by B cells are physiologically important against some bacterial infections. Common bacterial pathogens cannot undergo phagocytosis because of polysaccharide capsules. The IgM and IgG antibodies act as opsonins and induce phagocytosis. These bacteria are called pyogenic as their infection leads to pus formation. Pus consists of dead and damaged neutrophils which had reached this infection site. The overall picture about TI antigens in B1 cells can be summarized as follows. B1 cells have limited range of receptors. 
D1 cells are not present in lymph nodes, constitute 5% of splenic B cells and are important in mucosal immunity. These respond to common microbial antigens. These sometimes produce antibodies. Even B1 cells seems to require two types of signals, first via Ti antigen binding, the second via mitogenic component Ti1 antigens or cytokines Ti2 antigens for adequate response. Most of the B cells in adult animals are of B2 type. These have a receptor complex BCR on their surface. After they have matured, these are present all over secondary lymphoid tissues such as lymph, lymph node follicles, spleen and Peyer's patches. The naive or virgin B cells which are yet to encounter any antigen express some variant of leukocyte common antigen. Upon encountering a thymus dependent antigen, these cells become plasma cells. These are present in red pulp part of the spleen, lymph node medulla, malt and at the site of inflammation. So again let's kind of make sure that we understand what CD system is. CD stands for cluster of differentiation and this system of nomenclature of the surface antigens or surface markers is based upon this system. So the leukocytes are distinguished by their cell surface antigens. The most unambiguous way of identifying these antigens is by use of monoclonal antibodies. Leukocytes are distinguished by their cell surface antigens. The most unambiguous way of identifying these antigens is by use of monoclonal antibodies because these are very highly specific probes. A marker designated by its CD number may be specific for a type of cell or for a phase in its differentiation. Many CD markers are of course common to many cells but may occur in different proportions. So the CD markers, peptides, essentially characterizes a cell type. Immunoglobulins or antibodies were first detected in a sera of immunized animals. Subsequently, it was found that immunoglobulins also have a membrane bound form which is anchored in the B cell membranes. Assigning two roles to these different forms of the same immunoglobulin is a neat trick by nature. As both antigen antibody interaction in sera and binding of antigen to the Ig receptor is a specific process, the single molecular recognition process serves both functions. The binding sites to the antigen in both forms of immunoglobulin, the soluble secreted antibody and the cell surface bound receptor is identical. While the receptor form of the immunoglobulin is a transmembrane protein, the cytoplasmic domain is only a tripeptide. This is too inadequate to discharge the function of a signal transduction or a signal transducer which is required for B cell to become a plasma cell. Having only a tripeptide as the cytoplasmic domain in the immunoglobulin reflects the economy in design by nature. Immunoglobulin is specific for each antigen. However, the signal transduction mechanism can be common. 
So while designing the anchored form of the immunoglobulin, only minimum structural components are added to the soluble form of immunoglobulin, that is the antibody, which are cleaved off while producing the secreted antibody, which does not need anchoring. The polypeptides common to mature B cells are markers for such cells. CD79 handles signal transduction. Apart from CD79 polypeptides, immunoreceptor tyrosine activation motifs called ATEMs are intracytoplasmic segments. These are also part of other immune receptors. ITEMs can be phosphorylated by tyrosine kinases, which leads to B cell activation. Immunoreceptor tyrosine inhibiting motifs are present and can also be phosphorylated. Their phosphorylation leads to inhibition of B cell activation. Ig alpha and Ig beta are 20 kilo Dalton polypeptides. These polypeptides are present on all immunoglobulins bearing B cell forms, including pre B cells. This indicates that signal transduction mechanisms are put in place early during the development of B cells. The binding of antigen to the Ig receptor signals that new genes have to be switched on by nuclear transcription factors. Also some genes which are required to be expressed only in resting B cells have to be switched off. Ig alpha and Ig beta are also required for appearance of immunoglobulin chains on the cell surface. Transfections of a B cell by See DNA for H chain and L chain resulted in H chain and L chains remaining inside the cell. Simultaneous transfection with cDNA of Ig alpha and Ig beta chains resulted in the assembly of Ig plus Ig alpha plus Ig beta complex on the B cell surface. Ig alpha and Ig beta have cytoplasmic domains which are of adequate size to carry signal transduction. Binding of Antigens to B cell surface immunoglobulins provides the first signal. This signal alone is not enough in the case of PD antigens. If a second signal is not available, B cells becomes energic. TH cells provide the second signal. This signal also has two components. Finally, CD40 on the B cells bind to the CD154 on the TH cells. Secondly, TH cells release cytokines after CD40, CD154 interaction. The B cell, T cell cooperation is very critical for B cells to become plasma cells, for their proliferation and for them to start secreting antibodies. B cells are also antigen processing cells. While other APCs, endocytos, the antigen via the receptors, in the case of B cells, antigen bound to the Ig receptor itself undergoes endocytosis. After undergoing degradation, the peptides from the antigen again appears on the surface but along with another cell surface molecule called MHC class 2. T cells specific for the peptide antigen binds to the peptide MHC complex. Thus the clonally selected populations of B cells and T cells expand. Etams are associated with Ig alpha and Ig beta are now phosphorylated by protein tyrosine kinases. Some other surface molecules are also part of the BCR complex. CD21 is a complement receptor. This participates if the complement has been activated. CD81 is essential for lipid graft formation. This phenomenon and associated phosphorylation and dephosphorylation are common in B cells and T cell activation. The second signal via T cells is essential, otherwise B cells after binding to the antigen undergoes apoptosis. CD40 and CD40L interaction causes class switching to produce immunoglobulin G. At this stage, Fc gamma R2 binding to the Ig can provide a negative feedback and prevent B cell activation. T1 and Td antigens induce B cell responses very differently. Memory B cells carry IgG or IgA which are of high affinity than IgM or IgD receptor on naive cells. The responses of the naive B cells upon encounter with antigen and those of memory cells are different. The secondary 
and subsequent responses consist of largely IgG and result from memory cells. It should be made clear that in initiating secondary response memory cells have become plasma cells. Memory cells can migrate to lymphoid tissues just like live cells. However, some memory cells remember where they were stimulated due to imprinting in the microenvironment which switches chemokine receptors by interaction with local dendritic cells. The increase in affinity is called affinity maturation. Some affinity maturation occurs during the primary response after isotypic switching and some somatic hypermutation. As antigen concentration increases due to immune action, only B cells with high affinity receptors are able to bind antigen and are thus clonally selected to expand. In fact, there is enough evidence that secondary and further responses are mediated by memory cells only. The term original antigenic sin arises due to this. This refers to the phenomenon that human makes antibodies against any variant of influenza virus only against those epitopes which are present on the influenza virus to which they were earlier exposed. The advantage in this design is that why waste effort in triggering live B cells when memory can mount a quick and efficient response. A variant virus with completely new set of epitopes however is able to trigger live B cells. So, in this module, we have learnt about the outline of selection theory, the sign of a good theory in science is always that how some simple minimum number of postulates can explain all the phenomena which are associated or all the manifestations of that particular system. So, clonal selection theory based upon some very simple postulates is able to explain almost all the hallmarks of the immune system which is specificity, tolerance and specificity, tolerance and memory. We will continue to talk about in the subsequent modules that how clonal selection theory explains all these phenomena, but in this today's brief discussion it is very clear that it is a very elegant theory. We also learnt about antibodies and how antibodies are similar to the enzymes and finally we found out that how Linus Pauling's prediction of in 1948 turned out to be correct several decades later and catalytic antibodies are possible. We learnt about the types of the B cells, B1 cells and B2 cells and we learnt about the types of antigens. We also learnt about the effector and memory B cells. We learnt about what are hybridoma cells and what are monoclonal antibodies which are obtained from these hybridoma cells. While we will occasionally refer to monoclonals or monoclonal antibodies, but will not discuss them in later modules. So, it is necessary to point out the various applications of monoclonals or monoclonal antibodies in very broad terms. The very specific in nature that means they participate in molecular recognition processes in a highly specific fashion and that makes them very important ligands in affinity chromatography for purification of proteins and other molecular entities. They are also very important part of the vaccines. And one application which already has been there in so, so extensively uh, they have been used there is their 
involvement in designing in vitro diagnostic regions. Catalysis in the form of catalytic antibodies is another important application of course. Industrial process for purification of monoclonals in turn depends upon affinity chromatography mostly with protein A as the affinity ligand. 